I am Heidi Benjaminson, your host of Confidence Coaching, a podcast for mothers who want to stay calm and anchored during the teenage years. Life isn't a spectator sport. Success comes to those who show up every day with a pocket full of courage, grit, and a little sparkle. I'm glad you're here. Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 163, How Our Children Map Our Minds with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. This is my second time having Dr. Finlayson Fife on my podcast. It has been about two years since our last episode, which was 105. I will link to that in the show notes so you can go back and listen if you'd like. In that one, we talked about sexuality and confidence. I invited Dr. Jennifer back to talk about the idea that other people, and in the context of this podcast, our teenagers do know what we're thinking because they are doing something called mapping. They track our body language, they track our energy, they track our tone of voice and more, and they map things about us. And we all do this with everyone we interact with. Dr. Jennifer explains this very well. This is what's happening between our lane and everyone else's lane. And we give some examples of how we as mothers do influence our children and we can help regulate others in their lanes. So here we go. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much for being willing to come back on my podcast and share some of your expertise. I want to talk with you about um, certain subjects and certain um interactions we have and this certain piece of how our brains interact with others. And I knew you'd be the perfect person to come on and talk about it. Um, could you quickly introduce yourself? And then I'm going to do kind of an introduction very briefly to kind of what I want us to talk about. But who are you for whoever doesn't know who you are? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. And I, let's see, I have a PhD in counseling, and I've done a lot of um, postdoctoral training. So I did a lot of my doctoral training on marriage and family relationships. And I wrote my dissertation on sexuality and agency. Um, mm -hmm. But I did a lot of my postdoctoral training in differentiation theory. And this kind of challenge of, of psychological self-development. Mm -hmm. So I did mental health counseling for years, but I now am exclusively kind of in the educational and coaching realm because I'm working more with normative developmental issues, mm -hmm. uh, not pathologies so much. So how to help people to create deeper capacity for intimacy and richer emotional and sexually intimate relationships and so how to develop a more solid self and a more solid self is capable of deeper connection with others. And so the, the educational work and the coaching work I do is helping people to see this um, internal system that that's operating mm -hmm. in our relationships and how they can understand it and, and grow themselves up more in their relationships. Yeah, because sometimes just being able to see it, that whole idea of differentiation very much ties in with a lot of the models I use with my clients understanding, mm -hmm. you know, we are a separate being from our children or from mm -hmm. our husband and things like that. What I wanted you to kind of talk with us about is something that um, is this interplay in this model that I teach my clients, uh, kind of our stay in your lane type thing. So knowing mm -hmm. I'm in control of myself and my thoughts and beliefs and actions and mm -hmm. somebody else, everyone else is in their own lane and responsible for their, uh, what's mm -hmm. going on for them. And of course our actions are colored by, and beliefs are colored by the lens through which we see the world and um, mm -hmm. the experiences we've had. But it's not just those things alone. There is like influence that we have over each That's other. Right. You know, there mm -hmm. is the energy that we're sending through our body language, through the words that we use. You know, so many things do have influence and effect over other people and our children. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us mothers, um, you know, at some point we're like, why isn't my child doing, you know, what I want them to do? We would like to kind of control them if we could, mm, sure. but we really can't. But in a sense, we do have influence 
like very mm -hmm. much who we are, our attitudes um, might not be able to control our children to some extent. I'm kind of talking now about older. That's right. And so I love um, Dr. David Schnarch, who you use um, so much of his concepts in your coaching. One mm -hmm. of the things he um, developed, and I don't know if he was the first one, is kind of this tracking and mapping that other people, yes. um, and specific, you know, our children are tracking, and they're then creating this map of who we are and our beliefs and, and our mind. So I want to talk with you like about that. Could you explain what tracking and mapping what that is? Sure. So Dr. Schnarch, he he looked a, at a lot of the neuropsychological research that was being done on mind mapping ability um, and applied it clinically and, and wrote a lot about what this means for clients and for what's happening within families and so on. Because yes, to your point, we are ultimately agents. We we determine our choices. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. But other people do shape the context and the environment in which we're asserting choices. So it's both true that we influence each other, we impact each other, and also we remain ultimately responsible for our own choices. So what mind mapping is or how that shapes people's choices is that we, at the age of four or so, our ability to track other people's minds kicks in in a neurodevelopmentally um, typical child. Mm -hmm. And so that is to say, you, when you're a baby, you don't understand that other people have different minds than you, right? You, you kind of think you're all linked together. But as you grow, you start to understand, well, mom has a different point of view than I do. And so it's at, at age four that a child may start to lie for the first time and it's awkward and they don't do a good job of it. And it's very trackable that they're lying. Right. <laughs> but they, for the first time are maybe trying to manipulate what mom thinks by what they say. Okay. And like, I didn't do this, you know, yes, I didn't eat the cookie. Did it. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, like I said at age four, so that I wrote my name on the wall behind the couch. And when my brother asked me who did it, I said, my, my one-year-old brother, Carl had done it, you know, who's crawling around on the floor. <laughs> so, right. right. So not, not very skilled at lying, uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, but still, you know, I'm trying to manipulate my brother's What's view so of reality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, my child who's not neurotypical didn't lie for the first time until he was seven or eight. And my husband and I were thrilled when mm -hmm. he produced his first lie because it meant developmentally something was shifting in him. He was getting more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So this ability to map other minds is linked to desire and deception. Mm -hmm. And so we can track other people's desires. We can, we can deceive others to manipulate their desires, right? And we can also track truthfulness in other people. Now, this is not perfect, okay? And it doesn't mean that we always can read each other perfectly because our own desires, our own motivations can obscure what we will admit to ourselves, what we will let ourselves understand. But most of human communication is happening at this nonverbal level. Okay. Right? It's not just what mom says, it's the way she says it. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, she says she doesn't care, but everything in her body language, I'm mapping, she absolutely cares and she's mad. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. but, so that's why we're not just, you know, or somebody who's neuroatypical might actually take it at the concrete level of the words that are said mm -hmm. because they can't map. They can't map beyond that. What does the person actually mean? Mm -hmm. They can't map sarcasm, right? But you think about sarcasm as saying something that on its face, you are saying you don't believe it and you're actually doing it to take a jab at somebody. It's a very sophisticated right. psychological thing, but it requires our ability to map mm -hmm. to be able to pull off sarcasm for example. Mm -hmm. And like, will the so, other person map what I really mean? Okay. It, exactly. And so, you know, a lot of times when I'm working with couples, they're saying, I, all I said was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I don't know why you're so upset. Well, the reason they're so upset is because it wasn't the words, it was what the meaning was, and the spouse got the message. And that's why they're so distressed. Okay. So, I'm working a lot with couples around the actual meaning of their behavior, not just the kind of the ostensible 
um, right. position that they're taking with words. Give us examples of um, the signals that we send. How do our kids track us and any person, but how is it we just you just used uh, examples of like kind of tone of voice. Um, are there mm -hmm. other things? What are some other? Quick I mean, things? there's just facial expression. You know, okay. you're never going to be able to manipulate this in yourself. I mean, people that are con artists get pretty good at it. But mm -hmm. the thing is, we're pretty open books, whether or not we want to be. So facial expression, tone of voice, body position. It's just what we're tracking. You know, I remember I've told this story before, but my daughter, we'd finally gotten her in with this really good violin teacher. I was the the teacher had made an exception to take us on. And I think my daughter could feel my pressure. And so we go into the first lesson and my daughter's eight or nine, 10 years old. I can't remember, but she's feeling mom needs me to kind of impress this person and mom is wanting me to do a good job. And she just kind of starts getting resistant in the lesson. Okay. But mm. it's not like I said to her, Hey, you got to impress this person. Don't screw right. it up. You know, I I'm just like, Oh, this is very exciting. We're going to meet with this teacher, <laughs> but she's right. tracking my body posture, how I'm relating to the teacher, the things I'm saying, she's not an idiot. She's tracking the whole thing and she right. feels the pressure of it. And she feels she doesn't like it. And so she starts, re she starts resisting. Well, she's not saying, hey, I'm going to resist right now. I can just tell she's not that open to the teacher. She's being a little bit defiant. She's, you know, being a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And so she did this over several lessons. And then I would try to calmly ask her what was going on. But of course, I did not feel calm. I felt like, what the heck is the matter with you? Like, what is going on? Why are you screwing this up? You know, <laughs> so, right. and so I would be like, oh, what's going on in there? You know, so I'm trying to be positive, uh -huh. but she can track it. She can tell mom's mad, mom mm -hmm. is stressed, and mm -hmm. she's asking me questions. But uh, so, so we're in a kind of control struggle, my daughter and yeah. I. Okay. So yeah. again, on the surface, it looks... It's hard to explain it to people, but you right. can if watch you it. On you paper, can... it just, yeah. right. It's just it looks like normal. a normal conversation. But if you're watching the body. Yes. Yeah, so if you're like... watching a movie, you're like, okay, this mother is not as calm as she thinks she is. Right. Okay. Right. And the daughter can tell. <laughs> and yeah. the daughter is resisting the mother's pressure. Yeah. So what kind of things do our kids put on a map? So if we think about just a, you know, a map of the streets, we have stores, we have streets, we have intersections. Um, what are they putting on there? So you were just mentioning stress. I think, you know, they're obviously really mapping what brings us stress, what brings us anxieties. What are some other things that are key landmarks that they're mapping about us? Well, they're definitely mapping what my parents' desires are. How does my parent feel about me? Right. Does my parent love me? Am I secure here? Is it safe here? Mm -hmm. Right. They're definitely tracking safety. That's like at a very basic level. Okay. And in homes where there's volatility or parents that are really overwhelmed, you know, kids get very, very good at mapping. Some of some of the people talk about uh, what's the mm, I'm trying to remember how some of the theorists out there speak about it. I can't say it right now, but um, that a lot of people think, oh, the people that are best at empathy, right, mm -hmm. have grown up in a loving environment. And that's probably true with sympathy or pro-social empathy. That's mm -hmm. probably true mm -hmm. because they were loved and they learned to love and so on. But the people that are actually, this is some of the research, the neurobiological research, is that the people that are actually best at tracking often grew up in traumatic environments because mm -hmm. they became vigilant. And they knew when, oh, if dad does this, it now yep. means this is going to happen. Or if mom exactly. says this, like in five minutes, the house and is precisely gonna explode. Right. right. So the hypervigilance, they. Right. And I had a client who knew how she could track it. She knew what was happening. She knew how to mask her mind mm -hmm. to not let her father track mm -hmm. her upsetness, her anger, her ability to see her father's sadism because if he could track it in her he would turn it towards her okay and so she got very good at just masking her mind staying focused on the tv while horrible things were happening in the house right okay and so so you know i've had other clients they came home after school and they would immediately their antenna would be up tracking what mood is mom in mm -hmm. is mom in a good mood or in a bad mood because it's going to affect what i do next 
Mm-hmm. So trying to manage the their safety, trying to man, and this is linked to it, the anxiety of the parents by what the child does. Mm-hmm. The question of whether or not I'm loved or cared for, because if I don't feel loved, either I'm going to conform and try to get my parents to love me by being the super good child, or maybe I'll rebel against it if I think there's no chance of getting it. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I'm going to kind of punish or rebel or drive my parents crazy, which can make another child get more compliant, more careful. You know, so this is systemic theory where different people in the family are kind of balancing each other out to keep the cohesiveness of the family from erupting, from breaking. Yeah. You know, I, as I was preparing for this interview, I remembered back to a couple of years ago, Um, And I hadn't really, I I mean, I saw at the time afterwards what was happening. It was like, it might have been COVID and I think we were doing school at home. And I hadn't realized that one of my children was mapping. I, I wasn't intending for him to be the one. Another one of his siblings just had a lot of problems with executive functioning. And I was like very vigilant on top of his work always asking him questions like I was I was there was a heightened stress Mm -hmm. I was having and and I realized oh this other child is coming to me who this child who has no problems I don't want him to be necessarily mapping that anxiety but he's coming to me a couple times a day rattling off everything he's done and I realized oh he has mapped this anxiety that I have for this other child and is trying to kind of keep assuage something he's trying to to cope with something because it makes him anxious to see you anxious right right he this is not necessarily i don't know if in your case but other siblings can pressure the sibling that's struggling in some way because they don't they're trying to take care of the mom or the dad's feelings so this is the level at which families operate so much more than what we actually are saying you know what we're saying matters of course but communication is happening whether or not we want it to is mapping and tracking, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? It sounds like well, it just is. It is. So, and it's absolutely a good thing because it's okay. linked to survival, right? Okay. You know, to track the desires of other people is very important for keeping yourself safe. You know, think okay. about somebody in an abusive situation. It becomes fundamental to their safety to right. accurately map and figure out a way to keep themselves safe. I mean, obviously, these are very unideal situations. Right. But a lot of trauma survivors, even if it's dysfunctional in adulthood, a lot of those strategies were based in their ability to map their unsafe environment and to figure out ways to cope best within it. Mm -hmm. And so it is it is absolutely essential. It's essential to intimacy. It's essential to positive communication because in meaningful, intimate connection, including sexual connection, when it's loving and meaningful, you're mapping the mind of your partner as a positive, this person loves me, cares about me, values me, I can track it, I can see it, I can feel it. And this is a level of communication that's often nonverbal. It's very much an embodied communication, but a highly positive one. And so it's it's very much linked to our capacity as humans to be meaning makers And to be capable of sophisticated thought, intimacy, all the things that come with a prefrontal cortex that most, you know, that many creatures don't have. Now, dogs and so on, they're good at mapping too. It's kind of at a lower level. It's not at the higher verbal level. You're mapping, is this other creature going to attack me or is this creature, you know, part of the pack? You know, there's a lot of that mapping of, of the other as a part of survival. Okay. And so that's good. So even though like our kids maybe map our anxieties and stresses just because they're good at that, they're also hopefully mapping and tracking the love they are. and the attention and the, those things that come with, with helping yes. them so forth. Yes, okay. absolutely. They're mapping all of it and, and they're mapping the good and the bad. And, and the thing is the, you know, while staying in your lane is, is the essence of it, when you deal well with your lane, you have a positive if- effect on your child. Mm-hmm. So like my daughter, I started talking to my sister about it and like, why is she doing this? And, you know, my sister was saying to me, I, I think you are putting a lot of pressure on her. And so just in my conversation with my sister, I could see myself better mm-hmm. and was getting a hold of myself. My daughter had also given me some feedback where she said something like, like, I feel like you're on the teacher's side. And so I think I just like something clicked in and I understood. And so then I dealt with my lane, my responsibility, my negative impact, how I'm shaping this whole thing when I'm making it all my daughter's problem. 
And so then when I was working with myself, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything differently. I'm not saying to my daughter, hey, I I can see what a what a problem mm-hmm. I've been. I just was dealing with in the conversation in a different way. Mm-hmm. I would my energy was different. My body was different. I wasn't trying to make my body different. I was making my mind different. I was mm-hmm. taking a different perception uh, perspective, which is my daughter doesn't owe me success. That is not her job. Okay. <laughs> to be like, a great am I yes, exactly. I make my daughter into something that reinforces my ego, or am I going to be a parent to this daughter? and facilitate her continuing to grow and expand in myriad ways, one of which may be violin, but, but, but being, being a support for her. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just as I shifted into that out of my own self confrontation, the conversation shifted with her, the whole dynamic shifted with her Mm -hmm. because I was taking responsibility for my lane Mm -hmm. and how I was shaping other people on the road. And seeing what the beliefs and opinions, how that was kind of playing out and the energy. So I think that that brings us to a a good question here that I'm sure a lot of um, people listening have. And I always have is, okay, I would like to kind of change how I'm maybe approaching some of some insecurities I have, or maybe some messages I've sent, maybe I've inadvertently gotten stressed as we talked about sex or things that are Mm -hmm. uncomfortable or Mm -hmm. you know we can inadvertently send the message hey i'll i'll love you if you get good grades not that we say it in that way but there's like a lot of praise for that or maybe i'm even anxious that you're going off to college and these bad things could happen or yeah in divorces maybe oh shoot i talk so poorly about you know my spouse yeah what are some good ways that we can kind of repair that and change the mapping. So it sounded like with your daughter, like, okay, I've got to see what's really going on in my mind. Right. Well, that's what it is. You know, when I'm working with people in couples work, I'm helping them to see themselves more clearly. You you know, it does mean seeing their partner and seeing their partner's impact on them, but also how they are in their own experience and how they are shaping their partnership. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because the reason is because when people can kind of wake up to themselves, it increases their agency and their ability to choose differently. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have a child who's struggled with some executive function stuff and I would just kind of rush in and do things too quickly Mm -hmm. because he was slow to do it because it was, you know, he would get overwhelmed. And I don't mean you can't be a support, but it was more like me needing to be needed, perhaps maybe my Mm -hmm. own anxiety, just needing him to solve it, get it done, whatever, rather than, you know, it's all forgivable. But as I could see, like, I'm actually interfering with him taking on more responsibility, Mm -hmm. then it helped me to see myself and shape my behavior in a better way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the the way you can deal with it is sometimes it's just dealing with yourself that you you choose better, choose differently. Sometimes mm-hmm. it may be having a conversation about it. I mm-hmm. can tell that I sometimes rush in and solve and that's mm-hmm. not helping you. Mm-hmm. Or I can tell, I know when I talked to you about sex, you know, four years ago, I was super anxious and I think giving you some messages that I don't stand by currently. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's maybe addressing the specific message, but it's also mapping that the parent is actually coming back to the conversation, Mm -hmm. is willing to take responsibility for herself or himself, Mm -hmm. actually cares about what message I've received, right? Those meta messages Mm -hmm. are sometimes the most important ones Mm -hmm. that mom or dad is willing to evolve or Mm -hmm. apologize or change course because they want to do right by me. And that's Mm -hmm. a big deal. Mm-hmm. When a c- child tracks that, you can make a lot of mistakes like we all do, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. Thank uh, uh, th- but yeah. they can see like that. My parents actually invested in me. Dr. Schnarch has this uh, great quote in the book Brain Talk, and I'm actually I'm going to link to that book um, in the show notes. He says, giving your children permission to accurately map your mind is on par with giving them a parent they can respect. And that mm-hmm. sentence, I just thought, um, You know, I think we all want our children to respect us. And as I was uh, preparing for this and reading that, it made me think about, well, 
you know, I, I think sometimes we can be nervous to let our kids see our mind. Let's just kind of say that. Yes. Like, I, I, I don't know that we come into this like, oh, yeah, I want my kids to know every doubt I have or all of these things. Right. But it made me think um, I just had a son uh, start his mission for our church. And in the six months prior to that, we had like just weekly kind of mission prep meetings with um, him and me and my husband. And I realized in that time, and I didn't realize till kind of now preparing for this, in the, I was helping him, I was showing him our mind because, mm -hmm. well, and mine is separate from my husband's, but we were like, mm -hmm. ask us any question, ask us mm -hmm. anything, and we will tell you. And a lot of our answers, some of them were, no, we don't agree with that, or no, uh -huh. this makes us uncomfortable, or yes, this is why this, you know, yeah. so whatever the questions. And I didn't realize that I, I was hoping we're giving him um, a safe place that over the next two years, if things come up, he knows he can come and he'll get the, our opinion, you know, yes, your honest two. position. Yes. But then I was like, we're, we allowed ourselves to let him map our mind of yeah. like, what are, what are we kind of thinking? What, yes. what are your thoughts on that, that whole idea of our kids seeing our mind and how that, yeah. Garners well, so that. a lot of times, you know, I, my position is like deception is where it, it, it's in deception that darkness can grow. Right. Uh -huh. And so a lot of us are masking our minds all the time. Mm -hmm. We're masking what people can know about us. We're trying to hide what our spouse sees and understands about us. I mean, a lot of us say we want intimacy, but in reality, we just want a spouse that sees the good parts. The good. We don't want to really be knowable because to be knowable is to change, mm -hmm. is to see things that you don't like about yourself that you don't think are that great. And so a lot of us, that's so uncomfortable and it's so hard on our egos that we just often intuitively mask what's true about us, even from ourselves. So to be willing to let a child truly track you, to let yourself be knowable to a spouse, to a child, is good for the child because they can, it doesn't mean that everything they say there is perfect or Mm -hmm. worthy or even legitimate like it, you're you cannot see things about yourself that your child can see yeah but you're willing to live in what is true even if what is true is humbling to you right and you know this is just an example because I know you were saying examples are helpful to people but I was on I can't remember some podcast NPR or something and I was I was proud of that fact, right? <laughs> but I'm doing this kind of false humility thing when I was, and my son is watching me do this. Well, oh yeah, it's not a big deal, but yeah, it's, you know, blah, blah. And, I, and I'm and i trying to like downplay it. Uh, but of course he can see me. He's a he was a teenager at the time and he can, so he kind of get in the car. He's like, oh yeah, it's not a big deal, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> he's just going to make you fun of me. And I, you know, I had a good laugh with him because right, right. I knew that he could see me yeah. and I wasn't going to pretend it wasn't true that I was right. doing this kind of false humility thing. And, you know, I, I stopped doing it after that. I was like, okay, just like knock it off. Like, <laughs> right, right. right. So, right. so, uh, but th that's, that builds trust because, you know, teenagers like to poke holes in, in their parents, you know, mm -hmm. vulnerabilities and so on. But it's also, a, it's a way of saying, my parent doesn't screw around with reality. Like they are willing to be truthful and take mm -hmm. responsibility for themselves and not punish me for seeing them as real people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to kind of, yeah, have the confidence to kind of accept reality and to not need to either avoid it or, or deny it. So if someone, if, if a child's going off to college um, or, you know, these milestones where maybe we just have some very natural anxieties and worries that are not inappropriate. Do you think it's worth kind of having those conversations? Hey, I'm maybe a little worried about this, but it's my job uh, to manage absolutely. those worries. Like, uh, what are kind of some ways to have those? Well, yeah, well, okay. So it depends a little bit. Like, am I just worried, but I'm spinning myself out of reality and just into all the things that could happen? Mm -hmm. I talk about this in my How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex course. Is it an idea that I came up with and I'm just spinning it into all the myriad possible mm -hmm. ways that this, that this child could be hurt or something could go wrong, but it's not based on any data, okay? 
because you want to be careful about that. Now, you you could maybe say to your child, I just spin myself into worry. So this is not your issue. I just I, I, my, I have a great imagination. OK, mm-hmm. you, you could at least account for your anxiety if you think it's infecting your child. But you know that this is your challenge with managing your own fears. Mm-hmm. If, however, you are tracking data that would make you wonder, right, is mm-hmm. my child using substances? Is my child doing anything risky? You know, and, and you you have reason to wonder, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I think more candid conversations is usually helpful, mm-hmm. right? Listen, when so and so said that, it made me wonder. You know, mm-hmm. are you using substances, mm-hmm. right? Now that's just straight up. Uh, I am wondering. Mm-hmm. I'm tracking that. Can you talk to me about this, right? Mm-hmm. So it's. It's like um, you are exposing your mind, not in an accusatory, cruel way, but more, I'm going to talk honestly to you and I'm asking for the same in return, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's more like, you know, it is respecting of your child, actually, and it's it's it demands a kind of respect, too, when yeah. it's coming out of a care for my child around data I'm tracking that I think is worth following up on. Right. Kind of projecting and hoping they'll be honest or that they can then kind of trust that you can handle the truth possibly. Yes, exactly. If they think you can handle it and they think you're genuinely invested in them, they're going to have a lot harder time lying to you. Yeah. Because if they think, okay, my my mom or my dad cares about me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're not here to persecute me and control me. They're here because they care. Well, that child's going to have a harder time screwing with reality. Now, it doesn't mean that that they will always be on. I mean, but you can also map your child. Is my child being forthright or are they yeah. just and and or are they just giving me the answer I want? Right? Yes, yes. And am yes. I feeling too relieved because I couldn't handle <clears throat> the alternative or am I feeling relieved because I can actually see the honesty in their response? Right, right. Am I tracking it's honest or not? So to kind of close here, and you mentioned this earlier, you know, I often say if a mother changes, her whole family changes. Mm. Are there situations where that isn't true? Based on everything we've kind of talked about, I really do. And I really do Mm. believe through my work that Mm. a mother, just by her changing her lane, Mm. does have incredible influence. Absolutely. Our children, though, and our families, they do have their, you know, kind of free agency. I don't know if any neurodiversity to yes both are deeply true okay so both that we have tremendous impact and we have very limited impact okay Mm -hmm. and so it's like wait how can both be true you know the fact is you know this whole blank slate with our kids or anything close to that idea is just simply false right our kids are born and and they're there we're we're shepherds at most okay Mm -hmm. we're not getting molding. We're not, you know, carving our children out of stone and it's all about what we do. Okay. Because they are agents and they have choices and they are their own organisms that are working out their path. Mm -hmm. But how healthy you are, how self-regulated you are, how much responsibility you take deeply shapes the environment in which that growth is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean your kids can't self betray or make poor choices or, you know, they can do, they can and will do all those things. But when you deal with yourself, you create the most optimal environment in which they can make those choices. And so it's deeply impactful. It matters. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your kids' honesty has a lot to do with your honesty. You know, if you're willing to, your kids' ability to acknowledge wrongdoing and change has a lot to do with your own ability to acknowledge wrongdoing and change. Mm-hmm. And so when you do shape that environment, what has shocked me is at times if even just the same words I'm say would say to my kids, if I was dysregulated, mm-hmm. would just have a very different impact on everybody than if I said the same words and I was regulated. Mm-hmm. Like, it would push them to take more responsibility rather than resentfully comply or defy if I was dysregulated. If I was actually regulated and I said something about what I was asking them to do or wanted them to do or whatever it was, you know, they, there was more respect. There was more, you know, it would call, it would sort of pull them up to kind of bring their best selves to the response. And it was just kind of amazing to me 
how much impact that had if I was just dealing with myself before mm -hmm. I would open my app. That's awesome. That that is absolutely beautiful. I often, you know, say to people and see um, a dysregulated person cannot regulate another dysregulated person. Yes, you know, that's we right. need to be dealing with our own lane, our own our own that's mind, right. and that's be right. willing to self confront that. Um, where can my listeners hear more about you? You have some fantastic courses. I want you to talk about your podcast room for two. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I listen to, there is so much that can be gained listening to you coach other couples. It's really mm -hmm. amazing how much we can see ourselves. Yes. Good. Well, so you can find all my stuff on my website, which is just my last name, finlayson com. And if you've never heard me before and you want to just hear more conversations like this, you can listen to conversations with Dr. Jennifer where I'm doing this, you know, where you're just hearing my theory and my thinking. Mm -hmm. Room for Two is another subscription-based podcast where I'm working with couples and applying a lot of the principles that I teach. And I teach especially in the courses. That's where I really, you know, focus in a certain way and teach principles, which mm -hmm. I'll talk about in a minute. But in Room for Two, I'm working with actual couples around relational issues and the ways that couples engage, it, they get out of their lane, right? Mm -hmm. To You know, when you were saying, hey, you can't regulate someone when you're dysregulated. Well, that's what we do in marriage all the time, right? <laughs> I got to just control you, hammer you, get you to right. do the right thing so I feel good. get your act together, yeah. Exactly. I can't be happy until you do the right, right thing, right? So- and, and so that's so quickly what we do in marriage because our partner has a high impact on us. And that's true. But instead, we we instead of focusing on our own impact and who we are, we want to focus on theirs. And so couples coaching that I do is helping people to see themselves and how they're complicit in their challenges much more than they realize. And this is really helpful, I think, because people can see it through another story mm -hmm. and they can see themselves in it without having to necessarily be in the chair be the intense focus, but they can increase their intelligence about how to evolve the marriage, how to make the marriage better by addressing their own behavior. Yeah. And seeing so, it from that third person, almost like you were saying with your daughter and the violin lessons, like yeah. being able to zoom out. Yeah. I think seeing other couples being coached then allows That's us right. to then have that perspective on ourselves potentially. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I just have five courses um, that I teach that are teaching principles of development and differentiation and how they impact your sexual relationship, your emotional relationship, and how to develop your sense of self and sexuality in the individual courses. I have a one for men and one for women, two couples courses, and then one on how to talk to your kids about sex, which is really about helping your kids build integrity around sexuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Okay, I'll have links for all of that so that people can can learn more. But I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk about tracking and mapping. I think this is will be very, very useful. Thank you so much, Heidi. Okay, that's it for this week. If you would like personalized weekly private one on one coaching to improve your mental health to improve every single relationship in your life, sign up for a consult call at HeidiBenjaminson.com. A confident mother is the greatest gift to her family, not a perfect mother. Our families want us to feel confident, anchored, and calm. I can help you uncover this version of yourself. Have a great week.